the funny thing was that we hadn't yeah. planned to do this, this image yeah. and the conversation I was having with him, I had already, uh, you know, something because you're close to someone, you forget just how much of a genius they are, because he just comes across as like a friend and, you know, and uh, he's helped me with some other stuff. So I, I, I didn't think of this, although when I first seen this image, I got exactly what he was trying to do. He's bringing it into the modern age, that old image of the GPO, which can be recognised and uh, warmed to by y younger generation. Um, so I never thought about it until like the week before we came down. We have gone over some different ideas. And I thought, like, it's the obvious one. It's so obvious. It's because we're so close. That's why we haven't thought about it. So I, I then said to him, Robert, you know, my idea is on the left hand side, walking into the ambassador of Rotunda, we're going to do your reinterpretation of the birth of the nation. We're going to reinterpret that. And he smiled and says, Oh, thanks. I mean, I was here and I designed the For Sinn Fein, the backdrop to the RDS here in '96. So I've come through the whole period of being a young kid in the streets right through and being a full party member and doing time in jail and then becoming a full Sinn Féiner. I was there with the people who probably discussed and planned where this little uh, island is going. So they were all there with us back in Long Cash. We call it the University of Freedom back in the 70s. So Bobby Sands would have been one of our best friends. We would have talked and discussed and planned what the future should be. So, you know, I, I only name him because people are aware of Bobby, but some of the other legends there we had the opportunity to do, sit down and think what this island needs, what the Republican view of it should be. But in England, there was serious stuff going on. I mean, Irish prisoners being held in English prisons. It's like the way Muslim people are treated now. If you're Irish at all, we all know the history now, how Irish people were treated. The Irish, our Irish prisoners, our comrades in English jails, were not only being uh, brutalised and tortured by the regime, ordinary English prisoners hated them. These were vile terrorists. So the conditions they had been living under were horrendous. But as we were sitting in Long Cash, our visitors would come and see us every week. They could bring us in newspapers, clothing, books. We felt a great solidarity with our comrades being held in English prisons. And we started writing campaigns, started writing letters to the newspapers to try and highlight what was going on. I started designing posters, making up ideas for posters, which then we would take uh, the boxes which our, prisoner, our relatives brought us in with our food parcels, cardboard boxes. We would split the sides of them stick the papers down the sides, glue them back together again, put our dirty clothes in them and bring them out of the prison to our, our relatives in the sides. They would then take, dismantle that, deliver those sheets or those papers or those writings or those posters to the Sinn Féin group in the outside and they would then take them away and print it. So while we were in prison, we actually found part, we felt as if we were doing something. We actually ended up producing several books. Hugh Feeney, eventually, after Frank Stagg died and Michael Gohan, they did actually take a couple of the prisoners with Big Jerry Kelly and uh, Hugh Feeney were actually back to Ireland. Hugh Feeney came into our cage and first hand he was able to tell us the conditions of what our comrades were living under. So we ended up getting him to read it. I illustrated the stories. So I became a bit like Wadler Padgett. I became an illustrator. So I illustrated. We then smuggled it out and it was produced. We felt we make it a point here. We were able to educate, we were able to tell people our voice, our story. I vividly remember that the... Uh the commemorations of the Easter Rising, the 50th anniversary in 1966. My father took me to the Falls Road, myself and my brother, and we ended up that night in Casement Park, or the, the following night. It was probably one of the first times I'd actually seen the use of imagery on a huge scale, because they had the big massive uh, portraits of uh, the seven signatories, which I probably copied and reused several times afterwards for our own uh, celebrations. But the most important Part of that experience, I think, was the fact that uh, there was a sense of pride. I mean, you, you knew your father or your parents, your family felt very proud. And then you consider when you read later on, that they must have been on their knees for so long, you know, just to express yourself. Even us in, in the 70s and 80s, when we were sort of going out and painted on the walls, we were intimidated and threatened. I mean, this RUC were still intimidating you because it was a match which opposed the status quo which they were trying to impose on us. The RUC shot a young um, man there, young Michael McCartan, 1980 on the Armour Road. Young Michael was out painting the slogan. And uh, it was an excuse. They said that they believed he had a gun. There was no inquiry. The man who did it, the policeman who did it, got away scot-free. There was no real uh, inquiry into it, um, except for the public inquiry, which was carried out by Father Dennis Wilson in West Belfast, uh, with eyewitnesses to prove that it was under no circumstances. 
could his paintbrush have been misunderstood to be a gun. Um, but I think that was part and policy of the policy at the time, as well as that, uh, shooting people, writing slogans. They were also firing plastic bullets at young children. And the whole concept was to intimidate young people off the streets, to frighten families, you know, keep your children in. I mean, those kids, I mean, little... Uh, Carl Ann and uh, little Brian Stewart, they weren't even involved in rats. You know, this is something we have to get across to people. There was no rats going on. I mean, headlines and news, a young child has been injured, uh, seriously injured in West Belfast in the middle of a rat. Two days later, a uh, young person has died after, there was no rats at use in there. They went out intensely to shoot those kids, to send a message out to other families in Belfast, don't let your kids out. So they didn't, they wanted to uh, stamp out any visual um, street reaction to their presence on our streets. First and foremost, I see, I see us as a collective, as political activists. And as Bobby Sands says, everyone has a role to play, no matter how big, no matter how small. I think I realised during that period, because we discussed it, and I remember even Bobby may have been part of the discussion, but I know certainly that took place in Long Cash, where we realised, you know, you can't win a struggle through armed struggle alone. You have to build the big machine. I was shot. Uh, it's a funny story because uh, my grandson and uh, my two grandsons were down here with their mother and father about three or four years ago. And uh, my little grandson was telling me, and he's about 14 at the time, Grant, it was great. They brought us and showed us, you know, where uh, James Connolly and the bullet holes in uh, the TPO. And I said, why didn't take it to Parnell Square? See the bullet holes where they shot your granddad? You know, in 1981, the loyalists attacked the Sinn Féin building. We believe they were looking for uh, the shoot Joe Cahill, Nabi Dahil, Connell, or Rory, they would have been always in and out of the building. It was myself, Pat McGee, who subsequently became famous for his attempt to uh, blow up Margaret Thatcher and the, the Conservative uh, thing. Myself and Pat had just finished having fish and chips in the Kingfisher here at the corner around tea time, and as we were walking back to the building, we came across uh, a UVF gunman who actually had been, was in the building. and. I think he was maybe trying to make us escape as we accidentally came on top of him and he just fired blindly at us. I got shot in the leg, Pat got shot in the Phillies heel um, and of course it allowed the, the gunman to make us escape. During the West Belfast Festival we wanted to showcase what our community meant and we would have people like Tristy Moore from Dublin or from Kildare coming up to work for us. We had to celebrate him and celebrate the artists. So we did a lot of murals even around that period just celebrating those local artists and make the, the community feel more welcoming. And it is part of the politics of it. When you look at in the unionist, loyalist neighbourhoods, welcome to South Belfast, an armed gunman with a hood. Are they silly? Are they crazy? I mean, this is why we want to show that we're normal human beings. We have a voice. We have something to say. We're not Neanderthals. The best rule is one I mean, which has the simplest message. And would, I mean, bear in mind that the, the, we try to cover issues as they were developing. So we were like the sort of the blackboard of nationalist discontent and all we were doing was echoing the views of our community. So we wanted the greatest amount of people to get that message. Bear in mind that most people who are passing by that, they're only taking a glimpse at it. So you want that message to go through, get in home right away. And of course, if you use humour in it, it was a good example recently we did the Banksy thing. I mean that travelled everyone because it, it was uh, tongue in cheek political message. I think those are the, the best ones. I know that uh, one of the most famous ones was used actually an image of mine which was recreated. I didn't create the mural or the image. I created the image but it was uh, plagiarised and used by kids in South Armagh. It was sniper at work, sniper on hold, you know, sniper on holiday. I think that gets a message across but also with a sense of humour. You know? So it gets the audience on your side right away. The, the murals which exist in Belfast are probably the most uh, talked about on this little planet, you know, there's seem to be the only ones that are actually dealing. See, it's a strange thing, most murals appear after the revolution is over. When you take examples like Nicaragua, El Salvador, because of the very fact that if people go out to paint murals, well, death squads are going to maybe take them away and shoot them or interrogate them or imprison them. And I think it was the young people in the north who just in defiance of that because their brothers, their older brothers, their Fathers, in some cases, their older sisters, were being imprisoned during the hate blocks. They were not just being imprisoned, they were being brutalised and degraded and dehumanised. 
And I think young people like Marty behind us here was one of the first murals in the city at the time. Went out and said, you know, fuck you, you know, I'm going to tell your story. I'm going to tell my big brother's story and my uncle's story. And they went out to family and started painting the walls. The British soldiers, of course, tried to stop them as they tried to intimidate by shooting young men in the park. But I think the young people in Belfast and Derry and Murray says, no, you're not going to stop us. If you, just, if you throw paint over our mural, we'll be back first thing in the morning. And they did do that and replace it again. In fact, if you damage one mural, we will now paint five murals. So it was a, sort of a war of attrition for a while, um, which was won very quickly by the, the young nationalist kids in the north. Painting has got me through my entire life. Even in school, I mean, I have this funny one now, you know, when people say, well, it's not really art. Do you know what I mean? Murals are not art. You know, you have these silly middle class intellectual fucking nitwits. That isn't real art, you know. That's uh, sectarian graffiti. Well, the truth is, what I believe, and my first friend, in my first class in primary school, when we were drawing something, and the little boy beside me turned and says, Hey, Danny, that's some drawing. You're an artist. So if he says I'm an artist, I'm an artist.